Okay, this is just a uh, quick video to review the discovery of the atom. It's not meant to be a very comprehensive review, but it does contain the key ideas for the discovery of atomic structure up until quantum theory. We start with our Greek philosopher Democritus, who hypothesized that atoms existed and they were very tiny and they were the building block of all matter. And atom actually comes from the Greek word indivisible. These little atoms could not be broken apart. Much later, we have John Dalton, who's often called the father of a modern atomic theory. He says that all matter is made of atoms. Atoms of each element are the same. Different elements, of course, are different. And then combinations of elements make compounds, and we arrange them in chemical reactions. The first experiment comes with J.J. Thompson. He used a cathode ray tube in order to subject electrons to electric fields, and he discovered that electrons are negative in light. He also calculated the charge to mass ratio of an electron. After his experiment, the plum pudding model was developed that an atom is a solid core of positiveness with electrons sprinkled like plums in pudding. Eugene Goldstein did modify the cathode ray too by placing hydrogen atoms in there. Hydrogen atoms are just protons. He discovered that protons are positive and much heavier than electrons. Robert Millikan suspended oil drops using an electric field in his apparatus. In doing so, he was able to calculate the individual charge on one electron. Ernest Rutherford hypothesized that matter was mostly empty space. He's famous for his gold foil experiment, which he subjected alpha particles to. And those alpha particles bounce back in some cases, but most went through. And this experiment showed that there's a small, dense, positive nucleus. And he hypothesized that electrons orbit around the nucleus, otherwise they would crash into the nucleus. Niels Bohr looked at the Rutherford experiment and said, well, if electrons orbit the nucleus, they must do so with a specific amount of energy. He called these energy locations energy levels. During the time all this was going on, we have the Albert Einstein, who did a, a lot of things, but two in particular things that we want to talk about is he did describe the behavior of electrons as particles in the photoelectric effect. Now, the photoelectric effect, if you ever had a solar-powered device, light hits it, knocks electrons off, and we use those electrons in the circuit. That shows that electrons are particles. He also derived the fundamental wave equation, where C, the speed of light, is a product of wavelength, which is lambda, times frequency, which is nu. His discoveries led us to the next person that we want to talk about, okay, and that is Maxwell Planck. He studied black body radiation and determined that the energy coming off the wave of light that comes off a of black body is related directly to its frequency, and the energy comes off in specific amounts called quanta. Now, black body radiation could be an incandescent light bulb, a piece of tungsten that glows, okay, when it's heated. Erwin Schrodinger, he solved the actual wave function for an electron. So what does that mean? We believe that electrons are both particles and waves, and those particle wave theory was developed by another scientist that we'll be looking at. And it, it uh, showed us that we can't just treat an electron as a particle. If it is a wave and a particle, then there has to be a wave function for that particle. Now, it was important for uh, Schrodinger to solve that wave function because then we can start to interpret the electron location around the atom. At a famous conference, Louis de Broglie is the one who said that, guys, we have to treat an electron both as a particle and as a wave. And his wavelength equation is Planck's constant divided by momentum, or h over mv. Werner Heisenberg said, well, even though we have an electron like a wave, okay, we still cannot know exactly its location and momentum at the same time. So he's famous for what's called the uncertainty principle. So that was an important idea. Max Born 
looked at the wave function that Schrodinger came up with, said there's no way to interpret this wave because you've got pluses and minuses. That all adds up to be zero. So how do you interpret the wave? But if you square the wave function, you don't have that problem. You don't have any negatives. When squaring the wave function, it allowed us to interpret the electron locations in terms of probability. The probability, of course, led us to our s, p, and d, and f orbitals. But initially, uh, Schrodinger did not like the idea of, of his wave function being interpreted as probability. Why? Because he said, God doesn't leave things a chance. He designs things very carefully. Okay, in other words, God doesn't roll dice and let the universe uh, be um, just allowed to exist in just probability. He likes to direct it. So he came up with his famous cat experiment. He said, imagine a box where a cat is in there, and there's a vial of poison. And outside, there's a lever that you can pull, and the hammer would then smash this vial and releasing toxin in the air. But you cannot see inside the box. So then, because you cannot see inside the box, the cat is either alive or dead. So it's 50% chance alive or 50% chance dead. And he's like, see, probability is ridiculous. How could a cat be 50% alive or 50% dead? So it's just a thought experiment. No cats were harmed in this experiment. He just tried to come up with an idea that said probability is just not the way to go to interpret the wave function. Well, through time, Schrodinger did accept the wave function idea as being in probability. And today it's our standard, our S, P, D, F orbitals are what we use to interpret the wave function around multi-electron atoms and those are used in electron configurations to this day.